It is a rare pair who meet in high school, fall in love, hook up, and stay madly deeply in love for 50 years or longer. Our resident couples counselor, Dr. David McKenzie, helps couples recognize the early warning signs of relationship trouble. He's a theologian, a sex therapist, and couples counselor in private practice. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. David McKenzie back to Studio 4 to tell us more. Gee, you painted me a theologian and a sex therapist. I my, know. My daughter-in-law still has problems with Dr. <laughs> Father David McKenzie, sexologist. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm glad you've become a sexologist oh. because, uh, you know, you're good at it. Yeah, well, I think I am. Thanks. You're probably a good preacher, too. Yeah, well, I get, I get a, a different clientele. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really? Well, I, I, it's interesting. A lot of those who are into spirituality who come from a Christian or a Muslim or a right. Jewish background will come to me for those reasons. Sure. Plus, I, I mean, I... I'm secular in my approach. I'm not religious in my approach. Mm -hmm. but. but you're steeped in your theology and your history and counseling, I and that's it. very yeah. important, sure. don't you know? Sure. So, the harbingers of an early divorce, yeah. uh, warning signs. So, yeah. you're madly in love, the wedding's over. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I've referred often in this uh, show to the work of Dr. John Gottman, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a Seattle researcher and therapist. And in his book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, he discusses how he predicts divorce. And uh, he talks about various signs. For instance, couples who do not respond to repair attempts. If there's an argument and the one, one of the persons does not respond, you know, the poke, the nudge that signals that he wants to make up or she does, mm. if that person, if that partner turns away, those marriages won't last. Uh, if there's like won't discuss it, can't discuss it. Yeah, it's, you know they sulk, they go on for days and months, and the, the issue never gets resolved. Mm. They hold a grudge for forever. Okay, uh, hide it under the bed, exactly. still mad about it. That's right, that's right, and and and, and ruminate about it. Um, he talks about things like contempt and criticism, flooding, harsh startups, all of these things. Mm. It's just fascinating. I think couples should read that chapter together. Well. Why don't they see it when they're dating? <laughs> well, that all comes back to, again, uh, the fact that nine-tenths of us relates at a subconscious level, and just one-tenth is conscious. And so we are attracted to our partner for much deeper, more shadowy reasons than just the fact that mm. he's rich or good-looking or she's gorgeous. Um, we are attracted because we're trying to actually work out childhood issues. Um, Dr. Frank Somers of the University of Toronto, a psychiatrist, I saw him last night on the Sex Channel, mm -hmm. and uh, he was talking about, uh, which is the same techniques I use, getting couples back together again sexually who are living in either brother-sister relationships, and that is touch. We are touch-starved in our society, and uh, little babies and young, uh, uh, young children who mm -hmm. are not touched will often grow up to be violent, antisocial, uh, psychopathic. Touch is vital and important. Sure, but that's a tough one because I know many couples who live brother-sister, have yeah. separate rooms, and they're yeah. a bit older now, yeah. but they haven't had sex for years. Yeah, that's tragic, actually. Uh, I mean, there are some couples that say neither of us are interested in sex. That's fine. That's okay. Maybe it's the truth. Well, maybe it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, but for most, they want to have an active sex life. Yes. Yeah. So if you haven't touched somebody for a long time, if you haven't held someone, if you haven't kissed someone, if the romance is gone from your relationship, yeah. how do you begin? Yeah. Holding hands in the car? Well, well, as a sex therapist, I start them on a very small baby steps of uh, beginning to touch. We call it sensate focus. Uh, they lie in bed after a shower and they touch each other. Phones off the hook, no TV on. Uh, just for like 10 minutes they start. You can even, Dr. Somers says, just start by touching the hands. Mm. And there's no sex, you, there's no big carrot at the end of the row where right. you have intercourse. It's learning how to touch and feel touched and loved. Sure. Yeah. What if you don't even talk about it? Like if somebody's listening to this show and uh, so tonight you're out for dinner with your uh, husband or your wife and you just grab his hand. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure, any kind of touch is any healing. kind of touch. Any kind of touch. What about people who don't like to be touched? You touch yeah. them and, you, and and they're really uncomfortable with it. Yeah, that's usually an even a mate can be that of way. Of course, um, that's usually an indication of a lack of touch in their childhood, mm. and they're very uncomfortable. Touch is very intimate. So when, when you touch something, it's, it's touching all sorts of nerve endings. And what they found is that our neurological part is connected with our sexual part. And so if that's shut down, the sexual part will be shut down. Mm -hmm.
because you watch couples who walk around and he always has his arm around her. It's almost a protective thing, or he's stroking her yeah. arm. You think, isn't that swell? <laughs> he must like her. I don't necessarily know it's true. Yeah, well, it can be. I would like to come back to your question, though, is that if, uh, why don't we see these things when we first get together with somebody? Mm -hmm. And that is because literally in the first three to six months, we are blind. Um, I believe it was a Dr. Sharma, I think that's how you pronounce his name, did a study and found that arranged marriages actually lasted longer than marriages where we choose. Uh, of course, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that um, family and friends can pick out a better mate for you than you can. Uh, studies have shown that. Uh, the second thing is that a lot of arranged marriages are within a culture where divorce is not tolerated. Yes. So you've got all of that cultural societal mm -hmm. pressure to keep you together. And a little fear sometimes, too. Of course. Okay, but that stormy passion of courtship yes. is often over too soon. And mm -hmm. I know some counselors will say, well, uh, it does change. Yeah, it does. It's that stormy, to. lusty passion. Yeah. It has to change. You actually uh, become immune to the chemicals that are being secreted in your body that makes you, you know, my friend Bruce Attridge called it the anarchy of being in love. Uh, you go crazy. You don't read. You don't yeah. study. You lose yourself. You, you can't don't eat. You don't eat. It's a great <laughs> way to lose weight. Well, I know you have one lettuce leaf. <laughs> and you think, why was I so tittled when I left the restaurant? Because when you're in love, you forget to eat dinner. That's literally when I first met my wife 23 years ago. Uh, madly in love. I hardly ate. Yeah. I lost about 20 pounds. I know. You say, I think I just drank. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm not sure. It came. I wasn't hungry. You're I so know. excited. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we also have to look at the difference between common law and marriage. Yes. And the question really is, is there a difference? If you're common law and you're together 50 years or you're married and you're together 50 years, does it matter? What an interesting question. Um, I usually, when I'm interviewing couples, I'll say, how long have you lived together? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when the functional marriage begins. However, uh, not just because of my religious background, I profoundly believe that when the, the society, the community, sees and takes an interest in your relationship and affirms it, and you make a public commitment, that does have a psychological seal to mm -hmm. it. It doesn't mean you can never get divorced, but there's something very strengthening about the community standing behind you. Well, as a little girl, as you know, uh, when you were raised uh, in the uh, 40s or the 50s, yes. it, uh, if somebody didn't want to marry you, it was alas, alack. It was what? Alas. You go, alas, alack. Nobody wanted to marry her. Oh, oh, it was yeah. a big thing. It yeah, was yeah, one yeah. of the goals. If you weren't married, married by 22, or there was something wrong. Well, at least somebody should propose to you or you were a nobody. <laughs> you know, and it's not true. I've been through those days. <laughs> exactly. It's not yeah. true. It's yeah, simply not. not. But so many more people are, are choosing to live together, except, yeah. uh, well, Especially second time around, yeah. third time around. Well, well, Madonna said, uh, apparently upset yeah. her, her uh, boyfriend, but she said on one of the late nights that, you know, she'd rather get run over by a train than get married again. <laughs> Well, um, don't forget, we live in a post-Christian age. So that pressure to be you know, married and having children by the time you're 25, those days are over. Sure. I also think when we read about marriage in the books, it, they don't tell you the bad side yes. or the tough side yeah. or the difficult side. Yes. And, and so there's a lot of pressure well, to be happy, 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 and love, and love, and love. You're right. There's a lot of myth out there. And mm -hmm. the problem with that is it sets up expectations. Uh, you, you're supposed to uh, have that down after the first three months. Many people will think, oh my gosh, have I fallen out of love? Is this the right one for me? Mm -hmm. it, yes, don't, don't be frightened by that. Right. Park your expectations. Yeah, you uh, have They're to. irrational. The re you know, people make this distinction between loving and being in love. And I'm still struggling. Being in love is actually a psychological condition of, mm -hmm. of projection. Uh, love really is the building of the foundation of a deep friendship with common roots and negotiating, having conflict, loving, crying, laughing. That's what a relationship is. Mm -hmm. Trust. Oh, of course. People who marry and don't love each other at, in the beginning, and often that happens. You escape a bad re a relationship in your home. Yes. You just think it's time to get married. You yes. want to have children. Yeah. Uh, he, his mother's pressuring him and says, yeah, son, yeah. get a wife. Yeah. I don't know if that happens anymore, but yeah, so you, you get married, you, you like this person, mm -hmm. you're not madly in love. Mm -hmm. Do you think those couples often make it? 
Not often. Or not? Not often. Um, don't want to discourage anybody out there that has that. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my older son at 21 met his uh, present wife, who's now 30, and he's 33. Uh, she was only 17 or 18. And uh, they've got three children, a very strong marriage. So there, there are lots of couples mm -hmm. out there who marry their teenage sweethearts. Sure. Um, one of the things that happens is that if there's pressure from the family to get married at 20, that person has not experienced, experimented, hasn't gone out with a lot. And by the time he or she reaches around 40, they're, they're saying, my God, I've lived half my life and, and I don't even know what it's like to date. Right. I don't know what it's like to have a heartbreak. And so they're, they're in a lot of grief and pain of those lost years. Well, many parents say, oh, don't get married at, at 20. Too young, way too young. Wait till you're 30. Mm-hmm. Or w they always put a number on things, and I don't know if that's important or not, but 18, too young, 25, about right, yeah. 35, well, too late, because what about <laughs> babies? Well, women are much more uh, ready to marry around 24, 25 than males are. Mm. I would say males are probably best to wait till 28, 30. Mm. Um, because uh, males' brains mature later than female brains. You noticed. <laughs> well, there's evidence to support what I said. Oh, is there? <laughs> yes. I'm so happy yeah. to hear that. So yeah. we haven't made it up. Yeah, no, not at all. Still a boy. Between 21 and 23, new materials being added to the frontal lobe uh, in women. Yes. So that at 23, she'll say, I can't believe I did that at 18. They're a different person. Yes. That doesn't happen in a man until mm. about 24 to 28. Well, see, my mother always said they never grow up. They just get taller. <laughs> <laughs> they just get bigger. <laughs> at last, I'm able to love. You've heard this uh, from some people. Uh, at last, I'm able to love. Why are people not able to totally commit, love, let go, uh, yeah. be vulnerable? What are, what, what are the roots of that? Go back to childhood. It's all mm -hmm. about childhood. Attachment with mother primarily. If you have an emotionally unavailable mother or a mother who is addicted to alcohol or drugs or whatever, you're going to have a person with an avoidant attachment style. Mm -hmm. And so they'll get into relationships where their partner will cheat on them, leave them, or be emotionally unavailable. Or they themselves will shut the relationship down at a certain point sure. and find legitimate ways of being turned off of their partner. So fear of being hurt? Fear, yes. Because because the very first person they fell in love with was their mother. And so if that mother was rejecting at some deep mm -hmm. level, that child will in, in, inherit that. Right. And say, I, I can't, you know, I've been deeply hurt. I can't trust anymore. Can that child get over that? Absolutely. And, and I, I put them on a process of getting in touch with their inner child. There are lots of self-help books out there about mm -hmm. healing the inner child. Because often, as you know, the mate tries to help no. the other mate get over it works and works no. and works uh, no adult can meet depletion from childhood your parents miss the mark so you've got to heal yourself and you do that by walking with your child into the past and re-experiencing that and that's when you know you're hurt about something that's a bit irrational Mm -hmm. And you must have to go back to your childhood to yes. say, why am I feeling sad about that? He, what he did was not all that bad, well, but it uh, deeply hurt me. Uh, yes. But Somebody it, leaves you and goes away on a trip or something, sure. and, and you're in the puddle. Well, you're right, because emotions are irrational. And so a little child, if, if daddy rejects them or mommy does this or that or the other, a child will blame himself or herself. I must be ugly. There must be something wrong with me. Adults learn by reflecting on experience, mm -hmm. and that's why I have the adult in them walk back and reflect with that little child and reorganize through cognitive behavioral therapy what they're thinking to interfere with that false mm -hmm. thinking. When you see couples that seem to really tick along, they totally let each other be exactly who they are, it yes. seems to me. Yeah. Uh, that's the and key. If, if she wants to go out on a Saturday night and he wants to watch football, yeah. it's okay. Absolutely. Even if the neighbors say, gee, I don't know what's going on at that house because None of their she's out with her girlfriends and he's no. home watching football. No, they're not in that marriage. Gottman says that again. The common denominator that splits couples up is when one tries to make the other into a clone of him or herself. Right. Tries to make the other in his image. And nobody should control another adult. Oh, of it course just not. That's not a relationship. Can't be so. No. Uh, what about the vagabond, uh, the person who wants all the comforts but not the tie down, or maybe it's the commitment phobe. Mm, yeah. Uh, wants it but not willing to say, "I'm in the yeah. pond with you for life." Usually that does go back to childhood things. It also, I mean, can be reflected in a very deep hurt in the first mm -hmm. love of your life. I mean, I, I had a 55-year-old woman once in my office years ago weeping and grieving over a 13-year-old boyfriend that cheated on her in junior high. She had never resolved that. And it just deeply hurt her. 
And yeah. uh, I'm not saying it, it, it destroyed her life, but it's interesting how some of those griefs are never resolved. We carry them on through life. That's why you're the therapist and I'm not, because I say <laughs> something like, well, get over it. <laughs> you know, it was 13 no. years ago. Well, un unresolved, get a grip. I know, but unresolved grief can infect no, I you. Know. Yeah. And jealousy of somebody's dumped you and gone yeah. off with another yeah. and they're living happily ever after and yeah. they didn't live happily ever after with you and you're still mad sure. after 30 years. Yeah, well, that, yeah, um. that's a sign you're stuck. You need some professional help. Right, to let go. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't let go, you can't live. Uh, I as assume that uh, Mrs. Letterman, mm. is it Regina? Regina I, Lasko? I guess so. I, I think she's not so happy with... Dave, yeah. in fact, unhappy rumor today was that she only wanted $300 million to go away. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't <laughs> Apparently. hear Apparently. Oh, I didn't read Well, that. we don't know. Oh, it's all rumor yeah. and conjecture yeah. and all of that. But it uh, begs the question, why do uh, uh, mostly males, I don't know yeah. if it's yeah. true, but it seems to be mostly yeah. males, the, the governor of South Carolina, mm -hmm. Mark Sanford, Elliot Spitzer, yeah. governor of New York, former Bill Clinton. John Edwards, Bill Clinton. Yeah. Uh, Herod David, the King. Herod the King, <laughs> David Letterman. Yeah. Uh, they have... Uh, what well, is that about? Well, it's an interesting mix because men are very attracted by sight. Men are very into power and mm -hmm. wealth. And women are naturally attracted to power and wealth. Mm -hmm. So if you have a relationship, I'm not making excuses for David Letterman, but if you have a relationship that maybe is going through a very tough, vulnerable time, you've got all this power and wealth and prestige, and all these gorgeous women are after you, mm -hmm. that's, going to, that's going to tempt most men. Sure. I'm not saying all men yield to that. No, but why would he marry that particular girl? Because he apparently was having fun with a lot of the girls, especially Stephanie. Yeah. And now he picked this woman because he yeah. thought of her as a mother. Yeah. Yeah. But if, if the rumors are right, mm -hmm. even though he had picked a woman, committed to her, married her, and had a child with yeah. her, he was still yes, I know. Uh, fooling around with the girls at the office and kissing Stephanie in the car. Yeah. Well, I've, I've talked about this another time on your show about the three kinds of cheating. Yeah. Uh, one is the one night stand, a crazy thing, it's mm. forgivable. The second one is the affair, which is really does damage to the primary relationship. And the third is pathological cheating. The person's in a relationship and can never be satisfied. It's, it's all, almost a compulsion. They have to be out having affairs and cheating all the time. Mm -hmm. And that requires, that's goes back to childhood. So um, in, in some ways I'm saying, you know, let's all of us butt out, it's his business. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, I think there's a strategy in his preempting, um, getting out there first and telling Always. his story. Yeah. We've said that many times, get yourself ahead of the story. You bet. You I bet. think he made one tiny error. The first night, yeah. he should have apologized to the wife. Yeah. That's smart, Yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Like if you've really screwed up, yeah. you might say, um, and I'm so sorry I hurt my wife. I, I just wonder why, he, her. He, why he has to get out there and do any of this stuff. I mean, uh, that's. I mean, yeah. I think it's deplorable that a, that a person has uh, uh, sexual relations with people who are accountable to him. Mm -hmm. um, that's just not acceptable. Uh, so, um, uh, but anyways, I mean. Uh, Americans, especially, and Canadians, love these juicy, titillating stories. And there's almost a part of us that says, wow, somebody mm -hmm. that powerful can look that humiliated. Mm -hmm. I feel better about myself. Yes, we live vicariously. That's why we watch The Young and the Restless. Yes, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. How nice to see you. Always, Fanny. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. David McKenzie, a couples counselor and uh, a sex therapist. Coming up, he is all revved up for Thanksgiving dinner with some interesting additions. Chef Gary Steele is next with his version of Squash Surprise. Stay tuned. <laughs>